Today on One, we step back into the America of the 50s when greasers and rockabilly ruled, as one business tries to bring icons of the era back to their former glory. Then we're driving in style, even if it's only 20 miles an hour. Well, now we and we get a taste of the sounds of New Orleans with a local performer. All of that and more coming up on today's show, this is One. Cicero and welcome to One, a show about the people and places that make Central Florida special. Coming up in the show, what happens when black bears get too up close and personal? But first, we'll take a fresh look at a fruit lover's paradise. Growing oranges is a big part of Florida's history, and Showcase of Citrus has been doing it for four generations. The lush citrus groves draw thousands of visitors to the 2,500 acres in Claremont every year. And even though citrus is big business, the owners try to maintain its family appeal and look of old Florida. Well, being a citrus grower is it's before sunrise and after sunset. I tell you what, and it's, it's, uh, it's literally, literally like eight days a week. It's just nonstop. Having the business in the family, you own not only the trees, but you own, you have the relationship with the customers directly. So there's nobody from the outside that's, that's influencing what we do. And therefore, the longevity of it for it to be passed on to the next generation, I think makes it a lot easier. The way of life is, uh, it, it's just unparalleled. I mean, we have people come from all over the world that wish they had the opportunity to do something like this. Well, this is the product of three generations of work. And I hope that the fourth generation and the fifth and the sixth is gonna take and we, we, have, to pass the, we have to pass the torch. As the father of four boys, um, we have a circumstance, like most families, where some kids kind of are better at certain things. Like one boy is better at running a register or one boy is better at running the juicing operation. One boy prefers to go out and pick with some of our helpers. One boy may want to do the swamp buggy rides and drive a monster truck and do the eco tours. But once people get on the monster truck, they are out on uh, they're able to look out across the groves and their vantage point is just awesome. You'll see what the flora and fauna, the, the ecosystem used to look like. Uh, it, well, exactly matched what the Indians encountered back in the day before the European settlers came to Florida. One of the things we do differently to grow our citrus out here is uh, we have a very homeopathic approach to growing our fruit. We use no pesticides, fungicides, herbicides. It's a chemical free environment. But what makes us really, really unique is the fact that we grow over 70 different varieties of citrus. My favorite is the red navel. The red navel orange is a seedless orange. It has a bright red color like a tomato on the inside. So when you cut into it and open it up, it's shocking. They're sweet. It is just, it's divine. The comment that I really, really enjoy the most, honestly, is we've been coming to Florida for years and we have never had so much fun as coming to the Showcase of Citrus and being able to walk and bond as a family. Florida produces roughly 6 million tons of oranges a year. That's about 70% of the nation's orange crop. If you've driven near Cocoa Village, you've probably wondered, what is past gas? That's what we thought when we saw the store sign. But it's really about restoring 50s memorabilia. The owners, Walt and Terry, show us where they got their inspiration for their business. Past 
gas is not what you think it is. Um, what we do is we restore old gas pumps and service station related items. At least that's the way it started back about 25 years ago. It is an antique store. We do sell everything that's here in the showroom. Uh, all the restored items are restored right here on the premises. And again, we do everything from gas pumps and gas station memorabilia to uh, scales, penny scales, soda machines. Uh, we do bumper cars. We do the entire cycle. We pick it, we paint it, we polish it, and we have to pedal it. I mean, we could spend four or five hours on a, on a small piece and get it ready, um, or we could spend 80 or 100 hours on a piece, just in-house hours. There's never only just one project going on. We're always working on three or four, or at least three or four things at a time. Our products go all over the world, and our customers are usually restaurants, decorating, um, theme parks, movie companies. Largest endeavor back in 1989, we dressed three complete gas stations in a diner for a movie called Coupe de Ville. I mean, I get customers that come in and, um, you know, with their, with their kids, and they don't know half of what, you know, what they're seeing here. I mean, for instance, I mean, we sell these old driving speakers. People don't even know what they are. Um, what I'm trying to do is show them, uh, in my own way, what it was like back then, how things were made. Uh, everything was made with pride. Um, everything was made here in the U.S. Uh, it was bought here in the U.S. And um, you, just, you just don't have that now. The name Past Gas came, I don't know exactly when, but it was way back in the early time when I, when I first was starting to do all the restorations. And I guess I was sitting on the john one day and it just came to me. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's the way it, <laughs> way it happened. But uh, I guarantee you one thing, once you hear it, you'll never forget it. Past Gas has been in business since 1986 and you can visit them online. With more of Florida's land being developed, bears are showing up on city streets and backyards. So what happens to these nuisance bears? Florida fish and wildlife biologists show us how they capture and relocate them before they get into trouble with people and property. Well, fortunately, as we see the population start to recover, the bears do push out. They're not super social with each other. They're fairly territorial as well. So as the population recovers, they're looking to find their own piece of territory, their own space. And sometimes that does cross over into uh, our neighborhoods and among our residents. They very quickly learn that uh, garbage, pet food, bird seed, all those type of things have a high calorie intake and so they'll quickly learn that um, being in the urban areas where people are is a good living. Come on, get out. Come on. We try not to move too many bears. We try to get people to keep up their garbage and dog food and pet food and stuff so the bears aren't causing them any problems. But if that doesn't work and a bear continues to cause some issues, we have a couple of designated relocation sites. Ow. The all the way in the back again? Yeah. Sometimes it's a matter of just educating the residents. However, we find if it becomes a nuisance situation where the bear may be posing more of a threat or be too familiar with people in the area approaching them um, or showing less fear of them, then that's a situation where they ask me to go in and then ultimately trap the bear. I find that bears, their favorite thing is pastries, and I think that would trap me. <laughs> I put donuts in the trap. We ask the kids, okay, so what would trap you in one of these traps? And I think the popular answer is my, my youngest says popcorn would trap her in the trap. And actually, the funny, funny enough, that's what got this bear. I, I used popcorn last night, and lo and behold, we had a bear this morning. <laughs> What's not really to love about bears when you're uh... Uh, working on a single species like that, they're large and fluffy. They're really smart. They outsmart us a lot of times. We obviously don't want to hurt uh, the bears, but if we have to go into a neighborhood and capture a bear and relocate it, we, we, we take hair, we take measurements, we pull a tooth for aging, put a lip tattoo in, we put an ear tag in, and all those things combined make up you know, what we know about bears. 
We really need people to, one, not feed them. It, uh, it makes them very friendly to people uh, and they'll come around and they'll sleep on people's porches and you know in backyards and stuff. It's very easy actually for people to live in the same area with bears. A lot of these people live along some of the preserve areas so we try to teach them how to respond when there is a bear in the area, how to put their garbage cans out the morning of the trash day as opposed to the night before and hopefully that way we have a lot of peace and coexistence between the bears and the residents. Florida fish and wildlife biologists estimate that there are around 3,000 black bears in Florida today, compared to only 300 black bears in the 1970s. Coming up on One, see how one local company uses electronics to make life like animals. And we've got more animals later, why some farmers think smaller is better. But first, let's take a look at some nonprofit events and opportunities in our community. From dinosaurs to tigers, they move and sound like the real thing. You've seen them at theme parks and attractions, but behind the lifelike sculptures are complex electronics. The designers behind animatronics show us what goes into creating one of these creatures. It's really rewarding to come from sketch all the way to an actual living, breathing, movable animal. It sounds kind of funny when we talk about, you know, an elephant skin or a gorilla face or a big T-Rex to a, there's a pachys, pachycephalosaurus. Every time we have to take a package to the UPS store and ship it off and they ask what's in it, you say, well, we're sending two crocodile eyeballs. And uh, they're going, what are you talking about? Rainforest Cafe or T-Rex, they come up with an idea and we have to do the concept sketches. We'll sit down and figure out what we can make these animals do to make them look good on the stage. They want it to kind of tell a story, so we take a mom and a baby and kind of design how that would look together, and then you sculpt the, the mom and the baby separate and all the different pieces. Everything we do is very labor intensive. There, we have more labor involved with most of our projects than we do materials. The fiberglass shell is brought to the mechanical department, and that's where they kind of figure out how you're going to take the cylinders and make the eyelids move and how to make the mouth move and how to put all those cylinders and mechanics together in a small space where it all fits and it looks right and it moves right. We have to make sure that we have enough slack in the fur in certain places to allow for all the movements. I mean, then it comes to us and we put the skin on and paint it and punch all the hair in it. And then we'll all get together and decide what kind of movement we want to put in, how much action we're going to put into it, and then just work the mechanisms based on what we come up with and see if we can get to that point. The one thing that we really have to work with is making sure that it, it works every day. We kind of help direct uh, the clients as well in, in getting what they want for their show. Tell them, you know, you don't want it to snarl too much because you're going to scare the kids. You get attached to them, especially those, the ones that are more difficult to finally get it to where you want it. When we finally had to ship it, it was like you were saying goodbye to one of your kids. It takes at least five people and between two to three months to create one animal. They're half the size of a regular cow, but have all the same features. Breeding miniature cows is becoming a trend that benefits the farmer and the land as we visit a Sorrento farmer who made the move to smaller cattle. This is Cinnamon. And that's her little baby right there, that's Cinnamon Sugar. Come here, Cinnamon. We've had cows for years, but in the last uh, about oh, 10 years or so, we've started focusing on miniature cattle. He's a real nice animal. It's kind of, kind of typical of what we raise. You can see the big hump? And this is at less than two years of age. They already have a hump like that. We raise uh, miniature zebus that are in the 32, so this is, this is probably about 36 inches tall right here, down to, uh, so down to like maybe 32 inch tall. You have to kind of be careful with the longhorns. And 
we've raised Texas Longhorns since about 1994. But about six years ago, we started focusing on miniature longhorns. But you can see they're, they're larger than the, than the zebu, but they're very, very small for full-size cows. Think about a normal full-size cow might be this tall. They still have all the colors and the huge horns of the, the full-size longhorns, but they're just a lot less work. Both miniature zebu and miniature longhorns are easier on the pastures. They don't tear the ground up. They, they don't need the six foot tall fences. Um, if you look at Emerald's horns there, that's a, a pretty nice set of horns on a tiny animal. But you can easily keep a nice little small herd of miniatures and you can have them as companion animals, as pets, but they're also utilitarian. You're also, they're good beef. Uh, you can milk them. We've sent them all over, literally all over the United States, California, Colorado, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, um, lots to Texas. One of my favorite things to do is sell Texas Longhorns back to Texas. I love when people drive out here from Texas with their Texas plates and load up miniature Texas Longhorns and haul them back to Texas. I, I get a little, a little bit of a kick out of doing that. They have about 50 miniature cows on their farm, and the miniature zebu weigh between 250 and 400 pounds. Coming up, they may only go 20 miles an hour, but you can still ride in style in your own personalized golf cart. And the sultry sounds of a local singer with New Orleans roots. But first, let's check out some upcoming events from around the area. If you have a story idea, let us know by emailing us at one at ucf.edu. Getting around in a golf cart is a way of life in the villages. In fact, it's the preferred way to travel in the community. But it's not just for transportation. It can show off your personality and style. From luxury to quirky, personalized wheels are all the rage. Here in the villages, there's about 55,000 golf carts, over 100 miles of golf cart paths. So it's, it's a, a, a way of transportation and just fun. Like us, we had two cars when we moved here. We got rid of one car and uh, bought two golf carts. And that's all we drive. Our car sits in the garage for weeks at a time. And it's, the golf carts are the first thing to come out of the garage. Each cart is uh, unique in its own way, but some of them are an expression of their own personalities. Hey, how's Caponi here? Hey, shoot it, man. Hey, man, how are you? Good to see you in the villages, baby. I was born and raised in New York. Went to every game I could at the stadium. And the only reason why, one of the reasons why I moved to the villages is now I can go to spring training so I didn't get rid of my Yankees. The court says that you can take a girl out of New York, but you can't take New York out of the girl. I seen it and I said, I gotta have it. It's a 35 Chevy, because I was born 35. And then that Laurel and Hardy on the back, I got that from a friend of mine who was going through a bad divorce and she was busting everything in the house. And he says, take that, and I did. That was about 50 years ago. <laughs> I'm a retired firefighter. I did 31 years in a county department east of San Francisco. And like it says on the front, my retired engine was engine 87. I was sitting in the garage drinking back when I used to drink, and I've had it since 04, and it's got about 34,000 miles on it. So I've been putting miles. This is all I drive. It's got a lot of power because it's got a small V8 under the hood. The street rods are unique in their own way. They are all custom, and uh, they're the most unique carts in the world. We have over 420 of these running around. Do not have two identical. Everybody kind of makes them their own, 
and uh, it's, it's just a blast. There are more than 90,000 residents in the villages, and it has 30 executive golf courses that are free for the village's community. She's a singer and radio host with a voice that's as smooth and sassy as her New Orleans roots. And that's just a few of her talents. She also writes her own songs and is a published contributor for a blues magazine. Meet Sybil Gage. She's this month's One to Know. I'm broke and I ain't got no sweet talking daddy. Lend me a dollar bill. I'm broke and I ain't got no sweet talking daddy. Lend me a dollar bill. When I'm on the stage, nothing can happen to me. Nothing happens except the music. I'm looking for a daddy. Yes, indeed, I'm ready. I couldn't just go out there and think that people would like me. You have to have a a lot for them to see and appreciate. You'd have to grow into yourself and know who you are out there. Get out there, walk on the stage and take that microphone. When you take that microphone, you're taking everybody with you. Well, now we could be talk of the town. But when I was growing up, I had I, the grand luck of living just a few blocks from the Neville brothers. We would see them every day. There happened to be a bar right around the corner from where I lived. And I do remember one time, uh, Aaron knocking on my grandfather's door. I was raised by my grandparents, and he said, you know, hey, Mr. Mack, how are you? Uh, I just wanted to give you a copy of my, my new 45, and it was Tell It Like It Is. <laughs> just like that. It was sort of like being in a scene that hadn't happened yet. Everything was kind of just starting to cook in terms of the very popular music of the 70s and, and the exposure that New Orleans was gaining and gaining and gaining. But just growing up in it, it took me forever to realize Mardi Gras was not all over the world. Our great food didn't exist everywhere. I miss New Orleans every single day. However, I have this radio show that bridges my connection to New Orleans. This is Sybil Gage on the Stormy Monday Show, and I'm feeling it. Mm-hmm. I was in New York, and how I actually met my husband was that we were uh, working at the same radio station together. I went there and uh, did uh, a sort of an internship for about three or four weeks. He didn't know anything about anything, and I thought, oh my gosh. He really wanted to learn, and he was a very great radio voice, so there was something there to be honed, but it was his love for me, I think. I thought, well, wow, he really likes me a lot, you know? She put her hand on my knee and she just said, you're all right, Billy Gage. And I looked at her and went, oh, took my breath away. There's no answer to the question, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? But there is an answer to how many can dance on the point of that pin. And that answer is one, and it's Sybil Gage. I want the whole wide world to see her. That's what I want. Sybil's radio show can be heard on AM 1300 WMEL every Saturday night at 6 p.m. We leave you with a recent performance by Sybil Gage. I'm Amy Lissisro. We'll see you next time. The, the want you love inside. Well, some like the high road. I'll take the low road free from the grief and strife. Sound party, little city buddy. Yes, indeed, give me. Come on now, won't you?